Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, retired Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Welcome to Garden Success. Hey, we're glad to have you today. Glad to have you listening. We're going to talk about some different things regarding things to do this time of year, some stuff going on in the garden and the lawn and the landscape. Uh, If you'd like to give us a call, this is a call-in show. It's most interesting when you call in with your questions, because I can tell you this. If you have a question, somebody else will have the same question. Uh, One thing I like to say uh, is there's no such thing as a stupid question, just stupid answers. Well, that's how I like to like to look at it. So don't worry about your question. Uh, I, I'll worry about the stupid answers part. Okay, pressure's on me. Nine seven nine eight four five five six eight nine or by email garden success at t a m u dot e d u garden success at t a m u dot e d u. I'll go over some emails here uh, in just a little bit. Uh, this is a time when our lawns are waking up. The turf grass that we grow here in this area is southern warm season turf grass. It's it's not the things that we refer to as cool season, which you find up north. So things like fescue and uh, bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, there's even a Texas bluegrass too. Did you know that? Uh, that uh, grow further north, uh, primarily uh, for the lawns in Midwest and places like that. If you move from there, you, you're familiar with those nice, soft, fine-textured, clumping grasses that uh, are grown up there. Nope, done here. Primarily, we're dealing with grasses that have runners. Uh, St. Augustine just has runners on top of the ground, uh, which makes it a little more susceptible to some of the things that uh, can take it out in the way of drought, for example. Uh, and then there's the the turf grass that has the both the stolons on top of the ground and the rhizomes, which is like an underground stolon. Uh, it, it goes underground. And those grasses have a little bit better time of, re- of recovering. You know, if you scrape the surface clear of St. Augustine, it's gone. If you scrape the surface clear of Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, it's going to pop back through because it's got that underground part. So anyway, those are the kinds we have. Uh, St. Augustine, someone was asking me the other day about what's the best grass. And that kind of depends. Uh, plants, uh, in general, plants are like people. They have their good points and their bad points. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I bet if you have a best friend or a spouse or whatever, you know that uh, they're wonderful folks, but there's these few things that are <laughs> on the positive side of the, of the ledger. Well, grass is that way too. So St. Augustine, let's just talk about these a little bit. Uh, St. Augustine does best in the shade of most of our turf grasses options for down here. Uh, So St. Augustine, if it's too shady for St. Augustine, it's pretty much too shady for turf grass. It doesn't do very well. Uh, But uh, that is its plus. Its negative is that it, in general, is not as drought resistant. Uh, So when it gets dry, it dies. It lives like there's no tomorrow, and when it's too dry, it just dies in, in areas. And so when we go through droughts and heat, like last summer, it is rough. It is rough on St. Augustine. We lose sections of it. It weakens the grass, and opportunist diseases like take all root rot, which the name is a good one. It takes all. It literally kills the grass. The other things like gray leaf spot and, and brown pa- or large patch in the cool season, those don't kill the grass, by and large, uh, but Saint o- but take all root right does. So that's a that's a weakness of St. Augustine. Those stresses you got to keep it watered. Another plus of St. Augustine is it's more forgiving of an irregular mowing schedule. Now the best turf in the world is turf that's mowed really frequently, as frequently as you can almost. Uh, and uh, St. Augustine looks its best that way, but. If you had to get it a little taller and then cut it back a little bit, get a little taller and cut it back, it, it's more forgiving of that. When you get through mowing it back, it still looks okay. Uh, I'll compare it to Bermuda grass, maybe on the other end of that spectrum. Uh, Bermuda grass is, has its foliage up, its leaf blades up there in the sun on top. 
But if you mow Bermuda high and then cut it down half, and let's say you let Bermuda get three inches and cut it down to an inch and a half, it's going to look really bad because you're just going to have a bunch of dead looking stems and those uh, those plant parts will re-green and it'll get looking good again. But right after a mowing, it really looks bad. And, and St. Augustine is a little more forgiving on that. Okay, that's just pluses and minuses. Bermuda grass extremely tough. It puts up with a lot of stuff. There is a reason that almost every golf course and sports field in Texas has Bermuda grass because it recovers from that kind of abuse. Uh, you can make a really nice mowing, uh, a playing surface with Bermuda grass as well. The more often you mow it and the more compact the variety, some varieties are more dwarf than others, well, the better it looks. And so if you want a good looking grass, that is it. It has to have sun. It will not put up with shade, or at least not much shade. Uh, another thing is the more often you mow it, the better it looks. Uh, and so you do want to mow regularly for the optimum. St. Augustine, I mow mine at about three and a half inches. Uh, I've gone a little above that in the shade to four inches in the shade uh, because there's less sunlight and it just gives you, think of the leaf as a solar panel. It gives you a little more solar panel area in the shade to capture that dim uh, lessened light levels. Uh, so uh, Bermuda grass, though, uh, going back to it, it needs good sunlight. It is able to recover from drought a little better than St. Augustine. Now, having said that, you know, anytime you make a generalization, there's areas where it's incorrect. And we have a new St. Augustine grass that have been developed by Texas AgriLife, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife, and it is called cobalt like the blue color, cobalt blue. Uh, cobalt is very drought tolerant, getting up there rivaling Bermuda grass in its ability uh, to, to t survive a drought. Uh, so cobalt would be one that would be kind of an exception to the rules I've just been giving. But uh, anyway, it's fairly new, a little hard to find. Uh, it's on the market. You just kind of have to look around uh, to be able to find it and get it into your area. So that, that is Bermuda grass. The other thing about Bermuda that I don't care for is it gets those chiggers in it. You remember as a kid growing up, rolling around in the grass, and oh my gosh, you come in itching, you got to take a warm bath and try to, to soothe their skin from all the chigger itches. Well, St. Augustine doesn't have that so much. Bermuda definitely does, and so that's a little bit of a negative. And then the biggest negative for me as a gardener about Bermuda is it invades. It invades flower beds. It it thinks everything is its territory. It doesn't understand that there are areas you want it to grow real dense and thick right up to this line, and then you want it to stop there. Well, it doesn't play that game. So that is a that is issue of Bermuda. Zoysia, third one. Now it gets a little more complicated. There are broader leaf types of zoysia that are zoysia japonica species, uh, and we have a lot of cultivars of that. Uh, Palisades, uh, let's see, El Toro, uh, Jammer, those are three examples of broader leaf zoysias. When we say broader leaf, think of something about a third as wide of a, as a St. Augustine leaf. So it, it's much finer textured, but not as fine as zoysia can be. Then there are zoysias that do well uh, th that have very fine texture, and that would be something like a Xeon, for example. I believe Cavalier falls into that. I'm 90% I'm sure Cavalier falls into that category. Those are zoysia, typically zoysia matrella. Uh, it's a different species of zoysia. Now, breeders are making it more complicated by crossing. There's really, I think, three different zoysia species that are used in crossing. And uh, the, that then now you have stuff that's kind of a mix of the two. But I like zoysia a lot. Zoysia can make a very beautiful lawn. Uh, I especially like the broader leaf type, the japonica. Uh, the the variety Palisades released by A&M a number of years ago uh, is, is a favorite. A lot of people like it. It is just, it makes a beautiful lawn. And it is quite shade tolerant. Not as much as St. Augustine, but it does pretty good. If you can make it a bright shade, uh, it will it will do it will do well. Some of the finer textures, and this is counterintuitive to me, but um, the, something like Xeon, for example, very fine textured grass, it actually is some of the most shade tolerant of the zoysias. And uh, you know, you would just think with that little narrow leaf, uh, how much sun can it capture? Well, anyway, it, it's able to, and uh, it's it's quite shade tolerant as well. Now, those fine textured ones, you got to mow more often. 
Zoysia, in my experience, it, it, it's a tougher grass plant uh, in terms of the, the plant parts. So if your mower is dull, it doesn't slice through it as easily as an old St. Augustine leaf, <laughs> which is sitting up there like, I don't know, a lettuce leaf or something. It just It's easy to cut right through it. Uh, so with Zoysia, you want to make sure you have a sharp, sharp mower. You want to mow as often as you can. And I realize we live on a seven-day schedule in our lives, uh, seven days of the week. And so mowing once every seven days is kind of the natural schedule. Uh, so anyway, you, you just need to mow as often as you can. And the shorter you mow, the more often you mow. And this is true of all the grasses I'm talking about. Ideally, you would like to cut one-third of the leaf blade off when you mow. So let's say I have St. Augustine that is three inches tall, uh, and then I mow it to two inches tall. I'm cutting a third of the three-inch height off. If I had, let's say, a fine textured zoysia or Bermuda, one of the more compact types, dwarf types, and I was mowing it, I'm going to make these numbers easy. It's, it, I let it grow to inch and a half, then I mow it down to one inch, cutting a third off. So that Bermuda or zoysia would only grow a half inch, and it's time to mow it. With the St. Augustine, it's going to grow, in the case of my example, a whole inch. So do you see what I'm saying? The, the shorter you mow something, the more often you have to mow to avoid cutting off more than a third of the leaf blade. Now these grasses are, are somewhat forgiving. It's not a black and white line there. But just keep in mind, about a third of the height comes off every time you mow. That's important. All right, I will get back to lawns here in a little bit. Uh, it's time for, for us to talk to you. 979-845-5689. Give us a call, 979 979- 845-5689. Don't uh, subject your fellow listeners to me droning on and on <laughs> through the show. Uh, so I want to go to emails. Uh, Tad had a, a question about how long does it take if you buy liriope in a four-inch pot, you know, for those roots to uh, expand out? Uh, so he had planted a bunch of four-inch pots in prepared uh, soil, pretty prepared, uh, a little bit of shade in that area, which liriope can do that. Uh, Asian jasmine didn't do real good through the freeze and some of the summer droughts and, and the water quality and whatnot. Uh, so he's kind of wondering, you know, how long is it taking to expand? Well, it's a it's a gray line, Ted. Uh, in other words, after you plant them, those roots are start continuing to grow if the plant was in good health when you put it out there. Uh, and so it's going to, I would say, give it about two weeks and I would expect there to be some good root growth developing into the soil. It will not at all be fully rooted in, or uh, you'll still probably be able to grab them and pull them right up uh, two weeks later. But it'll be starting then, and then continue, con depending on the conditions, are you keeping it adequately moist? Is there a, a good uh, nutrient supply in the soil and enough light to push good growth? Uh, their shade does not equal shade, and so in deep, deep shade, you're not going to get the development that you would in a very bright shade or even a part sun uh, kind of location. Another question was about uh, raccoons and other critters that are digging uh, in the flower beds and, and digging some plants up or just rummaging around in there, if you will, uh, and kind of wondering what, what could you use. And, you know, some people talk about sprinkling cayenne pepper around or other things. I wouldn't use anything on the list uh, there, uh, Tad. Uh, some of them actually hurt your plants. And so what I would just suggest, uh, maybe well, you got a couple of options. I have laid chicken wire on the ground before uh, and just let it be sort of like a, a covering over the plants and everything and to keep the critters out and give the plants time to be able to develop roots because the critters aren't in there to eat your plants or to dig them up. That's just a side effect of what's what's going on let them root in really well that's probably not real practical for your area uh low growing uh low low, low uh, electric uh, wires the little pet fence wire type things that they make that would probably help a little bit too uh so uh, that's kind of it i i th those would be my suggestions there are some other things that people do to keep critters out uh, i am not a wildlife expert and uh, texas agri-life extension uh, part of the system now is the Texas Wildlife, used to be Texas Wildlife Damage Management Service. And I'm trying to remember if that's still the name. But anyway, that's part of the system. They have people that understand that. You can go online to the bookstore. It's agrilifelearn.tamu.edu. agrilifelearn.tamu.edu. 
www.tamu.edu and type in raccoon or type in armadillo or something like that and you'll get a publication that you can download for free that covers those critters and what to do about them and that was where you would get a much better answer than you will get uh, from me. Our phone number is 979-845-5689 979-845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu Dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, let's see Suzanne uh, sent us an email with uh, some potatoes the uh, like Irish potato new potato and they have some spots on the leaves and uh, looking at the foliage it looks to me like some type of a leaf disease potatoes can get uh, certain kinds of leaf disease uh, but at the same time it also I don't know the way the spots are located some of it has, uh, there's somewhat of a pattern to it as opposed to totally random. So I'm not real sure if, uh, what we're looking at there. There could be a little bit of a nutrition thing going on, but my guess is probably a disease. I wouldn't spray it. I would just leave it for now. Right. Getting good spray coverage. If you start really early, you can protect plants, foliage. But when it hits a point where they're kind of all over the place, your potato's probably making enough carbohydrates in even those affected leaves to support tuber development. And so rather than just get out there and, and spray when you don't have to, I think I would just, let's just go through this. The potato digging season isn't that far down the line. Uh, and I think they're gonna be okay uh, without, without the sprays. That at least is my opinion. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. Fifty six eighty nine, or by email garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, somebody I won't call the the number online but I got one of those emails that there's several emails that um, end in mms dot att dot net and like those kind don't translate over uh, if you're going to email me I uh, just need to do it through another system in order to do well. So I was talking about uh, turf and the types of turf we have and the importance of mowing. Do you know the, the secret to success in turf is really simple. Now there are a lot of products out there and they can be very helpful uh, in, in dealing with uh, issues on your turf or in, in encouraging a better growth. But the real bottom line is super simple. It's proper mowing, watering, and fertilizing. Mow, water, fertilize. That's it. That's the secret. Okay, the secret's out. It has been out for a long time. AgriLife Extension since the days of Don't Bag It uh, and before even Don't Bag It came along, which was many decades ago. Uh, before that, uh, was just saying mow, water, fertilize. That's important. The more often you mow, the better the turf looks. The watering needs to be a good soaking on an infrequent basis. So in between waterings, the soil dries out to a, a very moderate uh, to low level of moisture. And that brings oxygen in the soil. It does well. And you don't waste water. And also, think about this. Now, we have a lot of sodium in the water in the Bryan College Station area. Sodium is not good for soil structure. And you're paying for that drinking water to put it on. So why don't we just put enough to keep our, our turf healthy, but not so much that we're wasting it by over-applying it because you get to pay for it, right? So I would suggest a good soaking. This time of the year, if you watered with a half inch of water um, once a week, you'd probably be overwatering. I mean, really, it, we just don't need that much. Uh, then we, by the time we get to the heat of summer, it is blazing hot. It's probably going to take about an inch of water a week in the absence of rainfall. So when you overwater, you waste money, you waste water, and you promote disease issues on, on plants in general but on turf. So watering properly. You don't want your grass to stress, but you do want it to have a good soaking and then dry up between waterings a little bit. Uh, that is important. And then finally, fertilize. Mow water, fertilize. Fertilizing uh, primarily with nitrogen is the most important thing on your turf. Now, turf needs uh, 
a number of different nutrients, around 20 different nutrients that are part of general plant care. But uh, the key three are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's the three numbers on every bag of fertilizer just about that's out there. And so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The first number needs to be high. Second number, low. The third number, medium. So a ratio of 3, 1, 2, or 4, 1, 2 is about the right ratio that you put on your lawn in the absence of a soil test. Now, I know soil testing is not something that a lot of people want to do. I mean, it's just like it's an extra hassle. Just tell me what fertilizer to put out. Well, I, I did, 3 one, 2 or 4 one, 2 ratio. But I have seen a lot of soil tests over, what, 35 years as an AgriLife Extension horticulturist. And I could count on probably one, maybe two hands in all those years, the number of ones that didn't have an adequate amount of phosphorus in them. It's just almost, yeah, that is rare especially a lawn that's been fertilized over a number of years and had the clippings returned over a number of years. So I, I have seen a lot of lawns where, especially in spring, just some nitrogen is all you need. But there are other nutrients that could be needed, and a soil test tells you that. Like what if a soil test said, you know, you need more magnesium or you need more potassium than a 312? Maybe you need a 313, you know, to get more potassium in there, for example. Well, a soil test tells you that, and it's easy to do. You go to this website. All these A&M websites end in tamu.edu, T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. So what would be the one for soil testing? How about this? Soil testing dot tamu dot E-D-U. Soil testing dot T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. I would encourage you to do that. Follow the instructions on how to take a soil test and then you will know what's in the bank account in your lawn and you will fertilize accordingly. And I've seen a lot of lawns that it was adequate to just put nitrogen down. That, that's kind of pretty much what they needed. When you return your clippings, you are fertilizing your lawn. Not a full fertilization, but the what's in a clipping? It's, it's the stuff we just told you to put down, the 312, 412 kind of ratios. So when you do that, you're getting those numbers, but you're also getting all the micronutrients that it take to, took to grow a clipping. Listen, if you're holding a green grass blade that came out of your lawnmower, that green means it's got magnesium in it. You wouldn't have the chlorophyll molecule without it. It means it has iron in it. It wouldn't be green if it, had, if it didn't have enough iron. And so when you return your clippings, you're putting those things back to the soil surface. It just makes sense. Mow, water, fertilize. Those are the secrets to success uh, with any kind of a turf endeavor that you're going to do. Our phone number is 979-845-5689 if you'd like to give us a call. The email is gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Got an email from Bill. And Bill uh, has been uh, putting new mulch in landscape areas in the backyard every year. Good for you, Bill. That, that's a good idea. Uh, and by the way, when anyone's mulching, don't take the old mulch away. Just throw the new mulch on top of it and let the old keep decomposing. That just makes the soil better and better over time. But there's a problem here. Nut sedge. Uh, some people call it nut grass. Uh, nut sedge is... When it gets established, it is a problem. And I'm going to tell you that there are some ingredients out there that you can use. Some are labeled for use in lawns. Some are labeled for use in landscape bed areas uh, or gardens. Um, and they're going to have names like uh, Image. That's one kind. Image for nut sedge. The, the companies that make it have, have seen fit to put different ingredients and put an image on the name. But if it says image for nut sedge, that's the right one. Uh, and uh, there is another one called sedge hammer. That makes sense. Good name for something to kill nut sedge, sedge hammer. There's another one called manage. Uh, and, and then there's versions of those with those ingredients. And I won't bore you with all the ingredient names because it's, it's a lot to try to remember when you get down to the garden center. But those, those can be helpful. Uh, I have found that uh, Roundup glyphosate is not very effective against 
nuts edge. Now it will make it turn brown and go away and it'll come right back. Uh, a nuts edge tuber, here's, wh here's why nuts edge is such a problem or one of the reasons. A nuts edge tuber has a number of buds on it, uh, like, I don't know, it's like seven or eight or so buds on a nuts edge tuber. Uh, I didn't count them, somebody told me that. Uh, and so you chop the top off with a hoe and guess what? It sends up another bud and then it sends up another bud and then it sends up another bud. Now think about it, this isn't an immortal uh, organism. I mean, it, it, it has to have certain things to live. So when it sets, sends its top up above ground, once it has three to five leaves, you need to be doing something. Getting a spading fork in there, digging it, getting all the tubers you can out, spraying it with something to kill the top back, uh, or spraying it, hopefully, with one of these kinds I'm talking about that translocate down and are better at killing it. But never let it up for air. If uh, I think by May, I believe it's around May here, by May, one mama nuts edge tuber can already have eight daughters with viable buds on them. So if you, if you had one nuts edge tuber in the spring pop up by May, that tuber, even if you killed it completely, would already have, you would already have eight times the number of nuts edge that you began with. That is what, that is what is uh, so, so important. Uh, we, we got to make sure and get rid of that. I'm going to come back to Nuts Edge in just a moment. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. We're going to go to talk to David right now. Hello, David. Jeff, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm huh. interested in the cobalt, uh, the cobalt St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you ha do you have any information you're willing to share about whether you know of anybody that's providing it around here. I did a little search while after you mentioned it and couldn't yeah. really find anything. Uh, and also, I have, uh, that's part one of the question. The second part is all I could find so far is uh, disease resistance, but it's not really clear as to whether it's any better than something like Raleigh or whether it's just the same. Uh, so those are the two questions, availability and disease resistance. I, I should, on availability, I, I don't know. I, I just can't keep up with, the, you know, you have places that are all about turf, and then you have places that have a garden center with a little pa pallet of turf over on the side, you know, and, yeah. and and so I wouldn't expect to find it at one of the latter types of places. Mm -hmm. You may have to shop around a little bit. You may have to go uh, to Houston uh, area down that direction mm -hmm. uh, to find a place that has it. Uh, yeah, uh, offhand, I don't. I think you just got the search. I just haven't looked to see it logo. It's it's fairly new. It is on the market now. You know, when a new turf comes out, first thing you have to do is put it in fields and build up a quantity of it so they can then start right. to sell it. And we're at that stage now where it is being produced. Uh, but mm -hmm. it'll, its availability should get better uh, as we go into the next couple of years. Um, if anybody from Turf Department is listening and can give us a call, we sure would appreciate knowing more about availability on that particular one. Uh, I have planted some, and but I, I had to go way out of the area uh, to uh, to get it. Uh, but anyway, uh, that that's the best advice I can give you on that. What was I'm sorry? What was the second half of your question? Well, and and well, it's kind of related. Uh, because of what you just said about you planted some, and that's the disease resistance. Is if there's any oh, supposed okay. to be any improvement over the existing other the older varieties? Yeah, it, it's not worse. I know that. I I can't remember like large patch or we, we have always called it brown patch, right? Uh, or certainly, I don't know any grasses that are St. Augustine that have a variation in their susceptibility to take all. There may be some, but I. I've not seen any promoted that way. Gray leaf spot, uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, I, I would say that it's at least as resistant as the better grasses on the market. Raleigh is a little notorious for getting getting some of that uh, brown patch in it. Uh, as far as uh, chinch bugs, it doesn't have ex uh, exceptional. Uh, there's only one St. Augustine, and that's called Flora Tam. And for various reasons, you probably don't want to plant it in your home landscape, but uh, it is chinch bug resistant. Uh, the thing that is really good about the the um, cobalt is its drought tolerance. It just that is its 
that is really really important and uh and I've the the what I have I just planted recently and it it looks it looks pretty good. It hadn't had ch time to really fully develop uh, into a lawn. But one thing about these when when these grasses get released, um, David, the they are tested across the South. There's a turf grass cooperative turf grass program between universities like the University of Georgia and LSU and Texas A and M and and different Southern universities where they evaluate these uh, side by side. Uh, and so we have a really good program for before a grass gets released, knowing that's going to be a pretty good one. Well, I'm already <clears throat> pretty much decided I'd like to get some, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I guess I'll just have to start searching. Yeah, uh, I, th I think so. Now, as far as uh, one other thing, you, the take-all patch, I've, I've got a, a huge area in my backyard. I, I certainly didn't let it completely dry out at any time, but uh, and I'm 99% sure, because uh, I was watching out for chinch bugs, that it wasn't chinch bugs okay. uh, just because I was watching. But it's there's a doorknob. And so the the uh, the take-all patch, uh, is that – any time of year, or is it just in spring, fall, whatever? Uh, the turf pathologists have told me that it primarily is infecting during the milder, cooler time of the year. I don't mean winter. I mean like fall and spring, uh, yeah. especially fall. Uh, and then it moves in the grass. But I, you see the damage, uh, especially when we get into the hot weather and the demands for pumping water go up exponentially. And as the grass doesn't have a root system, that that's a bad combo right there. No roots and, and hot weather. Well, I guess uh, I'm I'm wondering when when would be a good time to if I'm going to do it, to spray with that uh, fungicide that I guess is supposed to help combat it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Azoxystrobin is is a fungicide yeah. that does well. Uh, Heritage is a brand of it. I I'm understanding that's becoming harder to get. Uh, you could also oh, really? use something that contains propiconazole. That's decent in its effect on it. Pri primary time to spray is in the fall uh, as we start to cool mm -hmm. off. When you're thinking about brown patch season or large patch season, that would be the primary time uh, for the take-all as well. But uh, that you can also do it in the spring, and that can be helpful. Uh, and so the main thing is just to get the grass as strong as you can, as fast as you can. Yeah. Uh, that that good health is really important. And yeah. you, I mentioned drought being a predisposing factor for take all root rot, but so is so is damage from certain weed killers. There are things that, for example, Trimec is a really common combination products sold in different brand names uh, and it's great to use in the spring but when you get into the heat of summer and the daytime highs are 90 95 uh, you can really damage weaken your St. Augustine and then you see the disease come in to that uh, as an opportunist so anything that stresses compacted soil excessive shade other things like that can predispose. Well, I have, I have pretty much pathetic soil, but I, I've managed to keep grass alive reasonably well. But mm -hmm. and there's and with all the trees I have, I'm not going to bring in uh, five inches of soil and kill my post oaks possibly. Right. So, right. so I'm just dealing with what I got, which is which ain't good. But uh, but that's all I can do. So I guess I'll just uh, try to find some cobalt, and, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, if I put it out, I'll I'll put some probably checkerboarded or something if I get enough, and then put some soil in between okay uh, and i'm sure that will be okay uh so i guess uh i guess that's it i was thinking like i have one other question but i i guess i've uh oh i, I was going to ask you about that astro whatever it is stuff uh that if you said that it's harder to find is that because of restrictions or you just, they just it's not they're not producing enough or what are you, you know? talking about the azoxystrobin fungicide yeah the the fungicide yeah. Uh, -huh. uh i i don't know i <laughs> I don't. I don't think they're like stopping making it. I. It, it's something about packaging and what the company is doing. But boy, uh -huh. I. I just need to not say more than that because I don't know and I don't want to mislead. Okay. Uh, but uh, someone just made okay. the comment about yeah, heritage is going to be harder to get or something, and and so that's all I know. Mm -hmm. But but it's not okay. the only okay. thing we can use. You know the the yeah. uh, propiconazole is another option, and it can do that. But just just realize uh, per, that per, what is that P P E R P was it? Propiconazole. P 
P-R-O-P-I-C-O-N. Yeah, propiconazole. Oh. Uh, but look around. Okay. Uh, I think, I believe Scott's, is it Scott's X? Scott's makes something that has azoxystrobin in it. So you okay. don't have to just use Heritage. Right. Okay. I, I don't. Right. I don't oh, keep all these you. chemicals on sh- lists on sheets in front of me, but that's that's. Oh, I understand. That's the understand. best. I know you're not crazy about using. I know you're not crazy about using brand names, but sometimes we get. Uh, we, yeah. We gotta. We gotta track it down. So. Well, uh, and I, that. yeah, and, and I will because on something like that, we don't have a lot of brand names to choose from. So it just right, it is right, what it is. All right. All right. Okay, well, I will try to track some down. I don't think I'm necessarily ready to drive that. Well, Houston wouldn't be a bad location for me because I can I can tie that in with a with yeah. a family visit. So, uh, but otherwise, otherwise, it's uh, eh, I don't know. I'll try. Yeah, to... But you're, you, yeah, I guess I guess they do have a lot of well, obviously a lot more places in Houston. So I guess there's a more like a greater likelihood that Cobalt would be there. So. Yeah, uh, yes. So this I'll, this I'll year, give that a shot. this year, turf's been a little kind of hard to to come by. I know locally, uh, they're having some some time of it trying to keep up with demand and things. So, I, if I find well, out anything, I'll I'll mention it on the air as far as. Um, well, tur- I appreciate tur- that. There seem I, I think there's a place on Highway 50 that that that's got it's a it's a turf farm unless they're out of business, but. As, as I'm going to Brenham or somewhere sometime, I don't know if oh, you've yes. been there. You probably yes. Yeah, so I did. I, yeah. I guess they're not growing it as far as you know. I can't remember the name of the place, but yeah, it's on the Brazos Bottoms down there, and right, uh, right, it's a it's right. a huge. Well, they they grow a lot of yeah. turf down there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, right. You, you so, may give them a call, and maybe you know turf yeah. people are usually pretty cooperative. If they don't have it, maybe they can tell you where to get it. You know, because they know yeah, what their okay. other turf co growers, you know, they're uh, in the industry okay. are growing. So. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. All right. Thanks, Thank Ryan. you, David. Uh, our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, success at tamu.edu. I was just finishing up a moment ago with Bill's email about Nutsedge. And so the bottom line on Nutsedge was that there are some sprays that can kill it, uh, uh, image and manage and sedge hammer are three examples. You just have to read the label. Make sure you can use them where you're where you've got the nut sedge. Two other comments about nut sedge. Uh, of course, the other was don't let it up for air. If you allow it to put leaves above ground and catch sunlight, it's it's beginning the process of building new tubers and strengthening the ones that it has. And so don't do that. Uh, just never let it up for it. That requires diligence. Uh, but you can win the battle, but not if you give it a chance to come up for air and re- recoup, if you will. Uh, then you're just you're just spinning your wheels. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, especially the yellow nut sedge, when you have wet areas, it proliferates like crazy. I mean, they turn into nut sedge chia pets. Uh, so if you are overwatering, you're making it worse. There are several uh, weeds of the lawn that are, by and large, uh, water-driven. And uh, dollar weed would be an example of that. Virginia buttonweed and yellow nutsedge are all examples that you keep them soggy wet and those weeds are going to proliferate. Doesn't mean that if you let it dry out, it'll kill them all. It just means, you know, make your job easier by not overwatering. Just another reason to not overwater. Uh, so those are some thoughts uh, on nuts edge. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I, I'm going to go go back to. Okay, I, I had an email come in from uh, Linda. Uh, Linda planted a cypress tree a year ago, and it has grown into a split top. And is it okay to remove one side or the other? Uh, and unfortunately, Linda, I don't have a Mac computer, so that dot h e i c i can't see it but i can answer your question without seeing it uh, a young cypress tree yes limit it to one trunk if it splits that doesn't end up going well just just one trunk and you can do it anytime you want i would rather have done it in the winter but do it now cut it off don't leave a stub just just remove that one trunk. Uh, I have a cypress that did have two trunks, but they were at a real nice angle. 
so they aren't pressing against each other. I, I don't like the looks of it, uh, but uh, yes, that's a problem. And just know this, uh, cypress trees in poorly drained soil send their knees to the surface. And so if you have them near a lawn, and when I say near, I mean 50 feet or more from a lawn, they will send those knees up. So it's just something you have to deal with. Uh, there are some types of cypress that uh, don't do that as bad, but again, you know, in horticulture, there there's a lot of great plants that we just have trouble getting a hold of, uh, and it's because no one demands them. Uh, that the, there's certain plants sort of become famous, like uh, Schumard red oak. People know red oaks; they know the name Schumard. Well, there's another red oak that's called Nuttall, and Nuttall does better in soggy, wet conditions. And so we ought to have access to that. And there are some. I saw some at Farm Patch a, a while back. Uh, but it, but it's, it's typically some of these types of plants that we wish we had better uh, access to. Uh, don't always do that. And the cypresses that don't make knees, that is a, that would be a good example, a good example of that. Okay, let's see here. Going down through these uh, emails. Um, I had a, a question come in about uh, someone, I, Ivona, excuse me, Ivona uh, asked a question about insect damage on an oak tree. Uh, and so it's kind of wondering oh, what's causing this, uh, you know, what, what can you do about it? Uh, uh, on one of the pictures, it appears that some sort of a uh, insect, like a, uh, not an insect, but a, a woodpecker has gone in and done the damage. Uh, to it. Uh, there could be, I do see signs of a borer working its way around inside the bark. That can happen on these trees as well. Uh, so the moth that you have there is nothing nothing to worry about uh, that is not related to what you're seeing. Uh, on the other, just you just kind of wait, uh, hope that thing closes back over the wounds from the sides, Ivona. Uh, that can happen. But uh, it's it generally, it takes a little while uh, for the tree to recover uh, from a significant amount of uh, damage. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, uh, gardensuccess at tamu.edu not uh, let's see here I, I want to I want to make another another comment uh, about um, some of the issues with uh, laying sod and turf and, and finding varieties and things I, I just finished uh, planting a lot of grass in front and back uh, just trying I'm trying some different kind of cultivars out just to find out if they're going to do well uh, do well for us and uh, I'm really excited about getting it done. Um, at my age now, uh, there's not quite enough ibuprofen in the local pharmacies to <laughs> make up for this old man crawling around on the grass. But uh, it, it's been good to get it planted. Of course, we're watering it very regularly. When you plant new grass, everything I say about how to water your lawn, just set it on the shelf. Uh, let's get the grass established first, and then you can pick up everything I say about watering the lawn. New grass needs to be watered uh, really a couple times a day uh, with a moderate amount of water. Not a, you don't have to water, you know, with applying one inch of water, but uh, you want to give it a moderate amount of water a couple times a day for about a week. That helps it stay alive until it can get roots down. The turf I planted had about three quarters of an inch of black clay soil from where it was grown down along the Gulf Coast. And then it's harvested and put on pallets on trucks and sent all over the place. And uh, that is a very little root system. I mean, imagine that you dig a plant up and you only leave one half inch or one inch of roots. Well, it's, how is that plant going to survive? Well, it does. But you got to keep it moist. And in time, after a couple of weeks, there'll be some good root growth down into the soil. And that turf grass plant, then we wean it back. After about a week, we can go maybe once a day. And then after another week, uh, you know, we can go every other day. Uh, and it just depends on the amount of sunlight and the type of soil you have and everything. But light, frequent watering the only time I'll talk about doing it that way is important when you are establishing uh, the turf. Now, you want to make sure and have good turf to soil contact. Now, if you have areas that are dead uh, and sections that you need to replant, uh, 
this is this is my suggestion. You do as you wish. Uh, I'm not telling you how to have a lawn, but uh, I would look and find the grass I want and figure out how to get it, uh, rather than just planting anything that's available. Now, if you can't stand looking at dirt and dead grass, I understand that. That's fine. But when you plant a lawn or when you plant a tree or a shrub, you're going to have that plant a long time. And so find the types that do the best. A palmetto, as a St. Augustine, does very well in shade. Uh, that's one I hadn't mentioned yet. Uh, it's, it's quite shade tolerant uh, among the St. Augustines. Not night and day different, but it's, it's good. Uh, and so find what you're looking for. Uh, you can go online. And uh, I should have uh, mentioned this when I was talking to David. Uh, the website aggieturf.tamu.edu, aggieturf.tamu.edu. I would go to that site and learn a little bit about these turf, um, the, the, the turf um, species and varieties. So if you go to the Aggie Turf website, aggieturf.tamu.edu, down kind of lower left, it says Texas turf grasses, and it tells you how to identify them, what the difference is, what they look like, and so on. And then there's places where you can click for each type of grass. So if I go to St. Augustine grass and click on that, uh, as we go down the list, there's one, two, three, four, six, seven, ten different cultivars that are on the list. Now this list is older uh, and so some of the ones that are on there are gone uh, and some of the new ones like the cobalt are not on there yet. Uh, and so you just have to kind of look through them. But those are examples. You can do that with Bermuda grass, you can do that with zoysia grass, uh, and it would give you some some good advice. There's also some really helpful publications for your lawn on there. In that same area where you clicked on Texas turf grasses, there's a nice uh, uh, click on the turf grass weeds, really good pictures of weeds, kind of explains those. And then something called publications. If you go to publications, you can find out all kinds of things about grass, like a water-wise checklist for your lawn, um, Bermuda grass selection for athletic fields, which of course you can apply some of that uh, to your home lawn use, mowing recommendations for wa warm season turf grass, uh, whether you should overseed or not, uh, pre-emergent herbicides to prevent weeds, uh, a homeowner's guide to herbic herbicide selection, uh, controlling Dallas grass and nutsedge. There's publications on those. And sandbur. Anybody got grass burr, sandbur? Insects like sod webworm, which pretty much we don't have. I've never seen it here in the Bryan College stationery, but you go down toward Houston and you got it. White grubs, chinch bugs, fall army worms, diseases like large patch and take all root rot are on there and then a calendar for Bermuda grass and for St. Augustine uh, that tells you through the year what you need to do and when. Isn't that great? A lot of good information uh, on that website. They did an excellent job and it's a challenge I know building a website because it always needs updating and then you know how are you gonna how are you gonna always keep things up to date. Sometimes I've thought that the minute something comes out in print, it's obsolete. <laughs> I think that that may well be true uh, when you're doing it. Okay, well, today's been turf day, I guess. Uh, while we're talking about turf, uh, you got, I hope you guys listen to Waterful Wednesday. Uh, Waterful Wednesday is a program, very brief program in the morning on Wednesday, uh, where Jennifer Nations from the College Station Water Department, where she talks about things related uh, typically to water and turf. Uh, there was a, a recent, I think it was this morning, uh, Jennifer uh, did a, a show on, um, um, gosh, Texas Superstars? Earthkind, Earthkind, yeah, Earthkind Plants. Earthkind and Superstars, by the way, are both are both uh, programs of Texas A&M AgriLife Extension that are excellent in guiding you. Uh, Earthkind uh, is basically, think of it like organic gardening, but not just limited to organic. So it looks at culturally, how do we avoid problems? What are the conditions that we want to create? And it would be things like building the soil right, selecting plants that are adapted to the area, uh, making sure that they're adequately tended and cared for and so on. Uh, and EarthKind is an excellent website and it's, uh, I was glad Jennifer uh, featured that uh, this morning. It's, it's very, very helpful. But if you're not listening to Waterful Wednesdays, uh, tune in in the mornings on Wednesdays, early in the morning. Uh, and not, not that long, but long enough to get a 
a few key points that you really need to know to have success with whatever you are, are going to be growing. If you haven't uh, prepared your flower beds, now's a good time to do that as well. Uh, if you uh, would like to uh, have good summer color, you want to make sure and pick some things that are going to last. Now, just because something is for sale at an area garden center doesn't mean it needs to be planted here. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, know what you want. Have, have good local information, uh, research-based information that promotes certain kinds of plants uh, and uh, identifies those plants, that is, that will do well and plant those uh, in the area. So for summer, one of my favorite summer plants for a long time has been vinca. Uh, I prefer to call it Madagascar periwinkle because there is uh, other things called vinca, more than one other thing called vinca. But uh, Madagascar periwinkle, it comes in uh, like the Cora. It used to be the Cora and Nirvana. I don't think the Nirvana is around now, but uh, they're resistant to disease. And boy, they go through the heat and drought and everything like nobody's business. That's a good one. Uh, purslane, when it warms up a little more, you'll start seeing purslane in garden centers. That's a good one, especially hanging baskets. Uh, probably my newest favorite plant for summer is angelonia. Uh, they call it summer snapdragon. Uh, you have to use your imagination to think it looks like a snapdragon. But it does have upright spikes of, of flowers in uh, kind of a purple. Uh, there's, a, there's kind of a reddish uh, colored version, a pink version, maybe coral looking white. Uh, really beautiful. And you see that around uh, landscapes in areas like entrance to subdivisions and things, they plant them. You can get a more compact one, a taller one, but they go through summer just fine. And there are other plants like that that do really well. So at this point, you can still plant petunias, but they're not going to have the length of life in most cases that uh, the summer snapdragons will, that carrying you on into summer. Uh, and when it comes to flower beds, you know, we can do as many color changes as we want, uh, but generally the bottom line is two changes a year, a summer plant for summer beds and then something that's cold tolerant for the winter beds. So pansies and violas would be a winter color plant example. And then the angelonias and zinnias too, zinnia bedding plants would be a summer color example. Uh, some people do as many as three or four color changes a year. Uh, it's all up to you, the, your budget, and how good you want it to look. Whenever you're choosing plants, uh, I would highly recommend you do some containers. Containers are versatile. You can move them in. I mean, they can really just set off an area and make it really look special. Uh, by bringing that color in. You know, with, with uh, in-ground plantings, you can only plant them where you can put a fl flower bed. Uh, but with containers, you can move them around. If you've got a plant that really wants sun, uh, you can put it in a sunny spot, and then certainly for shade. Uh, it, it, I just like using containers. Remember when you plant in containers that you want a container that's a little bigger than you think it needs to be. Uh, because here, our summer heat is so excessive that you don't want to have to water them twice a day trying to keep them alive. You want to have adequate soil. I refer to that as the bank account for both water and nutrients in the containers, a good quality mix, and good drainage holes at the bottom. Uh, and I, I love to do combination plantings of containers. It doesn't have to be more than one plant, but on a big container, that is a great way to go. Uh, the um, the geranium is, is a good example of, a, of why containers are important. Geraniums in the spring season, they can be out there in the full sun. They just do really well. When it gets blazing hot, I move my containers that have geraniums to an area that has morning sun and midday to afternoon shade. And they do okay there uh, in, in those conditions because they're not getting the full blazing sun all day. Just a few things to, to think about uh, when it comes to color in your landscape. Uh, I guess uh, I've talked about everything but vegetables today, so why don't we do a little bit of that. Uh, the vegetable garden. If you have not planted uh, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, and you want to, hurry up and get them out there. We're really getting a little on the late side for tomatoes, but you can still you can still make tomatoes if you get a good fast maturing variety. Not something that takes 80 days or 78 days. Something that moves a little bit faster. 
Uh, you can get those in your vegetable garden. There's a lot of warm season greens that you can be planting right now. Uh, squash and cucumbers. It's a great time to plant squash and cucumbers. They do super well here in our climate. And then melons like watermelon and cantaloupe or muskmelon. Uh, you, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to plant uh, the, some of the char French Charente, C H A R E N T A I, those are really tasty melons. One thing about uh, the melons that are just really kind of exotic, one of the problems that I typically run into is that they don't have the disease resistance. Okay, so the disease resistance is important, and a lot of those uh, just don't have it. Uh, by the way, if you want a planting chart, the AgriLife Extension Office, uh, the Brazos County Master Gardener page, is it's real easy. It's brazosmg.com, brazosmg.com. That page uh, has a link to Central Texas Gardening, and that's what we're calling it here, Central Texas. Uh, Central Texas Gardening link has an edible gardening page on it. And in that page, if you will scroll down, there's a vegetable planting dates in Brazos County. It's a green checkerboard chart. That's how you know you got there. And it tells you everything to plant at that particular time. We're in the big middle of snap beans and lima bean season. Uh, Swiss chard, yes, get that in. Swiss chard's more heat tolerant than I think it's often given, given credit for. Uh, sweet corn. This is a good time for sweet corn. I already mentioned a uh, computer, a uh, computer, cucumbers. Eggplant is transplants. Yes, great time to do that. And really, with the beginning of April, April 1st, no fooling, uh, melons like cantaloupes, honeydews, and watermelons and all of that can go in the ground. Uh, if you would like to have okra, it likes hot weather. And so, you, you, I mean, you could plant it now. I usually plant mine uh, mid to late April. Uh, it does really well. Uh, southern peas, the same thing. Let it warm up a little more for those, but you can still plant peppers. They will do okay now. Uh, and then any kind of a squash, including winter squash, and that would be like pumpkins, acorn squash, spaghetti squash, uh, let's see, kabocha kubot types of squash. Those all do really well now. Uh, so those are a lot of things you can plant. Oh, I forgot uh, the, the I, I mentioned this a while ago, but the, the, um, uh, summer greens, and that would be things like Malabar and Amaranth. And there's a green called Molokia that does really well in the heat here. Uh, and there's others that we can choose from. But get out there and enjoy the garden. Boy, you're not going to have better weather than this. Uh, this is the best time of the year to enjoy being outside. And everything you get done now sets that plant up for success by building the soil, by planting the right plant, by taking care of it early on, getting it established, so that when the d tougher days come, uh, you're not out there, you know, fighting all of the problems in the heat, the blazing heat and everything. Well, thanks for listening to Garden Success today. Uh, we're here every Thursday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. We we'll hope you tune in, and don't forget, you can listen to past shows on the KAMU-FM website as podcast. You've been listening to Garden Success with retired Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.